common conversation is had in our household and perhaps in yours after seeing a movie that was adapted from a book. It usually goes something like this. They left out! Or the protagonist had black hair in the book. That Tom Bombadil was left out of the film adaptation of The Fellowship of the Ring infuriated a good friend of mine, so much so that he wouldn't watch the rest of the trilogy. Or if we're talking a historical event that provided the backdrop for a film, it didn't happen that way. And while we usually hear that the book was much better than the movie, we always hope for more. I just try to remember that there's usually a disclaimer at the beginning of most films based on so-and-so's book. I was reminded of these conversations when, as I was preparing for this homily, I decided to preach mostly on Psalm 23. Yes, I know I preached on it in March, but I had a different revelation this week, and I'll get to that in a moment. But in another area of planning for our time together this morning, I decided that we'd sing Psalm 23, or at least an adaptation of it, instead of reading it. So I chose, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is. It is, after all, one of our most beloved hymns. All was good. Until the key idea I wanted to explore in the psalm was not reflected in the hymn. How could Henry William Baker leave out such a critical phrase? And then I realized that Baker had just written an adaptation of Psalm 23, and I decided to cut him some slack. But that didn't stop me from wondering about that distinct phrase. There was no reference in Baker's hymn to he guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. And so here you can see the psalm as it shows in the prayer book, as well as Baker's adaptation. And it was that phrase that's there in red that caught my attention earlier this week because, to be frank, I'd never heard it addressed. We're so accustomed to reading this psalm as a psalm of comfort. That's one of the reasons it's so frequently used at funerals. We also turn to it when we are in trouble. The stories of it being recited in foxholes during battles is just one example. A song of trust is how scholars categorize it, so its popularity in either of those circumstances is justified. As I suggested in March, it seemed particularly appropriate for our circumstances as we headed into the dark valley of COVID land. And that trusting sentiment is clear in The King of Love, My Shepherd Is. But I was stunned, almost literally, when in one slow reading of the psalm, I stumbled over and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. The shepherd acts on our behalf for his name's sake? How had I missed that? More importantly, what might it mean? As I sat with that for a day or so, I wondered if this was some kind of concern for God's own reputation. I recalled such other instances of the phrase. Indeed, I used my wonderful Bible software program to discover that the Bible contains some 27 occurrences of the combination of the words name and sake. 20 of them are in the Hebrew Bible. But I doubted that reputation was at the root of for his name's sake. Indeed, there was more. Three examples might illustrate this. The first is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 14. The Israelites, as they drew near to the promised land, sent spies into the land. When they returned, most of them counseled against mounting an invasion. Joshua, Moses' chosen successor, and his partner Caleb, on the contrary, asserted that such an action would be successful. The people, however, went with the majority of the spies, and then complained about Moses and Aaron, 
bringing them out of Egypt only to die in the wilderness. In response, God told Moses, How long will this people despise me? I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. Moses interceded, however, seemingly playing to God's self-interest. If you kill this people all at one time, then the nations who have heard about you will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land he swore to give them, that he slaughtered them in the wilderness. God relented of his plan, it would seem, so that God wouldn't appear weak. The second, second example is found in the book of Joshua, chapter 7. The Israelites had made it into Canaan, but had just experienced a disastrous defeat at the city of Ai. This time, it was Joshua who complained to God about bringing the people out of Egypt only to die in Canaan. Oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has turned their backs to their enemies and retreated? The Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? The appeal, again, seems to be God's reputation. My final example is found in the book of Ezekiel. The prophet assured those exiled in Babylon that they would return to Judea, but not because of anything they had done. Ezekiel writes, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will sanctify my great name. Again, it was for God's own name's sake that God acted. But as much as it might seem to appear that God was demonstrating the human characteristic of concern for reputation, there's something deeper, more significant in all these references to action because of the sake of God's name. God, most significantly, has a mission to accomplish and has had since the very beginning. And so the actions show God's intent as seen in Ezekiel. God's very being, summarized as God's name, demanded that God's covenant people be restored, despite their failings. It is not for your sake that I'm doing this. I will do this to sanctify my great name, which you've allowed to be profaned. God's restoration of Israel after Babylon, however, was a restoration suffused with hope. And that is because it was through God's covenant people, Israel, that God's creative intentions might be shown. This was also a reason beyond reputation seen in the story of Numbers. There again, God's covenant people would demonstrate God's intent. God would not allow their weakness to detour the ultimate goal of establishing a center from which God's greater purposes could spread. It was only through that people that God's intent might be made known, as Joshua made clear. If the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land cut off our name from the earth, what will you do for your great name? In all of this, there is much more at stake than God's reputation. But the core is the shepherd's fidelity to the sheep. As a reading from the Gospel of John reminds us, Jesus knows his sheep, is devoted to his sheep, and calls his sheep by name. Therein is a reminder, too, that we are, after all, sheep, in need of a shepherd. And it is here, in our present circumstances, that we return to Psalm 23, verses 3 and 4. The shepherd leads us in right paths for his name's sake, even though we walk through the darkest valley. How do we make sense of this? If we are in a dark valley, and I don't think I'd have to argue very hard that COVID land is a dark valley, 
how do we imagine that we are being led through that valley on right paths for his name's sake? And what does that imply? As I mentioned earlier, we often turn to this psalm in times of trouble. We look for comfort for ourselves and our loved ones. And the psalm certainly does lend itself to that. But that critical section of verse 3 indicates to me that it isn't so much our benefit that is at the core, but rather God's. The shepherd does care for us, to be sure. God has shepherded Israel from the very beginning. The covenants with Noah, Abraham, and Moses were all focused on the care and survival of God's people. But as we've seen, at root is also the furtherance of God's greater mission, God's great desire to bring all people into fellowship with one another and with God. And in our present circumstances, the shepherding of God's people through COVID allows that mission to continue. Using the language of our readings, what happens when we are refreshed? What happens when we've had rest in the sheepfold? What happens when we've survived the threat? We realize that our help, our shepherd, is greater than we imagine. The shepherd's comfort transcends our anxiety. The psalm seems to end with us dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And certainly that is our hope. But in the meantime, we as sheep, we as covenant people have something to do. As God's action for God's name's sake says something about God, so also does it say something about us. As that critical verse makes clear, God does things for God's reasons. We are led on right pathways for God's sake. And so we are God's necessary partners in advancing God's mission. So it is not for our sake, but for God's sake that we succeed. It is for God's sake that we incarnate justice and compassion, including wearing uncomfortable masks. It is for God's sake that we, too, become good shepherds, providing verdant pastures and plentiful tables and overflowing cups for others. God's mercy, as implied in the various stories about God considering action for God's name's sake, God's mercy is always shown to the end that relationships are restored, that justice is upheld. That is the mission behind God's creative and redemptive activity, to bring all of creation into good relationship with each other and with God. The psalm asserts that the right pathways are those God desires. Our challenge is to determine prayerfully what those might be, not just for ourselves, but for our congregation, as well as for our mission to the wider community. The dark valley of COVID land doesn't prevent us from looking at the other end of that valley and at the light we see and the light we must bear there. Psalm 23 allows for multiple adaptations. Henry William Baker's was one possibility. Isaac Watts wrote another, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need, which is hymn 664, if you have a hymnal. We will hear yet another in a few moments. All emphasize one or another aspect of what those brief six verses of the psalm contain, often, justifiably, as I mentioned earlier, focusing on comfort. I'm simply adding another possibility that of recognizing our role in the Good Shepherd's initial and ongoing mission. What adaptation might you write? Amen. <laughs>